In this talk, I will talk uh, about uh, the details of the IS-40 FPGA um, at the low level. For a long time, when you wanted to do FPGA design, um, you had to use a large proprietary software suite. Um, but some time ago, Clifford Wolf created the uh, iStorm Rahni PNR uh, uh, Yosis toolchain, which allows to uh, do this in free software. The advantage of this is it is much faster. You can, for example, run it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, this presentation right now is running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, you can look into the detail. It is not longer um, a black box. So you can do something which is very much in the spirit of this event um, in the Daten schauen. You can look at the data. And that's what we're going to do in this talk. So. What is an FPGA? At a very high level, you could say it is an integrated circuit whose logic you can define. For example, you could use an FPGA as an AND gate or a shift register or a whole microprocessor. So the way you're doing this normally is you write a high level design in a hardware description language process this via a series of commands um, into a binary machine-readable description of the design and then load that onto the FPGA. This is how this works in detail. You start out with the hardware description, normally in VHDL or Verilog, um, then process this in a step called synthesis, which results in uh, a number of uh, logic primitives readable by the computer then pass, uh, uh, take this file and another source file, the .pcf file, in the place and route step, which maps this onto the real hardware in the FPGA. And the result of this step depends on the toolchain. In this case, it's an ASCII representation of the bitstream, which is pretty much equivalent to the binary bitstream. It's just an ASCII file with zeros and ones. And then you take this file and translate it into the bitstream for the uh, FPGA. On the right-hand side, uh, for comparison, it's how it is with the processor. You start out with a source file, for example, a C source, um, which is preprocessed and assembled, uh, preprocessed and compiled into an assembler source file. This file is assembled by the assembler into the object file, and the object file is linked into the executable. Now, you might wonder why uh, there are two steps on the right side, where there's only one step on the left side. Um, the object file is already a machine-readable machine representation of the program, but the object files are linked together for, uh, into a final image, which can be executed by the processor. And there is a similar step for FPGAs. You can take the binary bitstream and compose multiple binary bitstreams into a bitstream with multiple configurations from which one can be selected at runtime. But normally it's not done, so um, it's uh, dashed here in the image. Now, I think the best way to explain this is to give an example. This is the rod example from Rahni PNR. On the left side is the Verilog source file. On the right side is the .bcf file. The Verilog source defines one module. Um, logic in Verilog is uh, broken down into modules. And uh, this module called top has one input CLK for the clock signal and five outputs uh, D1 to D5. The .bcf file is basically a map between the inputs and outputs of the top uh, Verilog module to the physical pins on the package. It says, uh, the CLK signal is connected to pin 21, which is connected to uh, 12 megahertz oscillator on the uh, iStick. And D1 to D5 are connected to pins 99 to 95, which are connected to the LEDs on the iStick. The part of the toolchain which is used in this case is this part on the left, which is now highlighted in red. First, the Verilog file is synthesized this is done using EOSIS. Then the resulting BLIF file and the .pcf input file are placed and routed using Rahni PNR. 
and the result of that is converted into the bitstream using icepack. These are the commands used for this. Yosis is, you can use Yosis as an interactive application. It implements a series of commands which operate on the design loaded into, the, uh, into Yosis. And there is one command synth IS40, which consists of about 20 subcommands, which does the steps necessary to synthesize the design. So the, dot P, uh, the dash P option um, specifies which Yosis command to run. Rachni PNR needs to be told which exact device and, uh, and footprint are reused, so it can map these onto the logic cells and I.O. blocks on this FPGA. And iSpec basically converts this. I'll give a short demo of this. Um, Hmm. Hmm? Yeah, I think I missed... Oh, that was right. Okay. Oops. And the problem is that the... Um, that I can't read the, um, the font, so I think I need to enlarge this. The beamer is really small. I hardly can't see what I'm doing right now. Um, okay. Okay. So. This is the input file, the Verilog file. Um, there is the um, there is the PCF input file, and I created a small make file um, which contains the commands necessary to process these. I'll first generate the blip file so you can see what it looks like. This is the output of the synthesized step. Then this is converted into, uh, this is place and route to the ASCII bit stream. This is basically a text file containing zeros and ones, but it is structured. You see there is a block for each I.O. or logic tile in the FPGA. And this finally is translated into the binary bit stream, which can then uh, pro be programmed onto the uh, FPGA. And the result is uh, this rotating pattern on the ice stick. Okay, um, next, in order to understand how the FPGA works, um, you need to know which kinds of logic uh, can be represented in the FPGA. First, there is combinatorical logic, which basically means you have a number of inputs and outputs. The inputs can all be zero or one. And the output only depends on the inputs at that time. So if, for example, for an input of all zeros, the output is ones, then you know whenever the input is zero, the output always will be ones. This is done in Verilog using the um, uh, using input, output, and wire uh, uh, symbols, um, and the assign uh, statement. So, for example, in this uh, module, there is an input A and an input B and an output Y. 
And just to show how this works, um, I also declared an uh, internal wire W. And W is assigned to be A and B, and Y is assigned to be not W. These statements are always in effect. So the order in which you, uh, you specify them does not matter, because at every time W is A and B, and at every time Y is not the signal in W. The next thing is sequential logic, which means it can depend on uh, the, the previous um, inputs. So the logic has a state in itself, and the state is represented in what's called registers. A register is basically a D-type flip-flop. So um, you declare uh, something as rec, in this case rec r, and use the statement always. Always defines some, um, some event, in this case uh, the positive edge of the clock. Normally positive is edge is used, you could also use negative edge. Um, and every time this event occurs, the expression on the right hand side of the uh, lower than equals is assigned to the thing on the left side. And so R keeps its value until at some point um, the clock goes from negative to positive and the, um, the logic expression not R is assigned to R. The expression itself, the not R, is, evaluated or is, is always evaluated. It's just at this point that it's taken into uh, as, a, as the value of R. And finally, there is another type of uh, logic which can be really confusing if you don't know it. Um, always can be used to express combinatorial, combinatorial logic. Um, if you have a statement of the form always add asterisk, then this means every time something on the right hand side changes, the left side is reevaluated, which pretty much is the definition of combinatorial logic. So you use an equal sign, in this case two, and R needs to be declared as a register, but it is not a register. There is no flip-flop in the FPGA synthesized from this. Just so you know it uh, when uh, you see something like this. Okay, now look. let's look at the uh, FPGAs. Here are the three FPGAs supported by iStorm. In comparison, on the left side, the 384, which is the smallest FPGA in the series, um, then the 1K and the 8K FPGA. This talk will be mostly about the 1K, but it mostly applies also to the 8K. It's larger and has more tiles and uh, two instead of one PLL. So let's look at the 1K. And since this is pretty small, I'll zoom in to the top half of this image. As you can see, there are three types of tiles. Um, there are the red ones, the logic tiles, there are the yellow RAM tiles, and the blue I.O. tiles. Um, logic tiles are where most of the logic of the FPGA happens. Um, you could use the logic tiles to create a RAM, but uh, this is not very efficient, and so there is uh, special RAM tiles which can store much more data than you could store in a logic tile. And the I.O. tiles are mostly for uh, communicating with the uh, I.O. pins. Every I.O. tile can be connected up to two I.O. pins. Um, there is one pin in the top, which is gray. Uh, this is because this pin is not connect uh, This I.O. block is not connected to a pin in this specific package. This is the TQFP 144 package, um, but it is in other packages. So I'll now zoom in to one of these uh, purple logic tiles. This is how a logic tile uh, looks at the inside. There are eight um, logic cells, which uh, are composed of a lookup table and a flip-flop. And each of these uh, logic cells can have up to four inputs and has one output, uh, one bit. So the logic tile on the whole can output one byte of data. There is also a carry signal, which uh, goes from one logic cell to the next one, and from the last logic cell to the first of the next logic tile. And there are three special inputs shared by the logic tile, 
a clock signal, a clock enabled signal, and a set reset signal. Two things can be configured for these logic tiles. Um, the clock can be configured to be in effect on positive or on negative edge. And the carry in can be configured to be always zero or always one if desired. Now, I'll further zoom in to one of these um, logic cells. This is how a logic cell looks on the inside. The four inputs are connected to a lookup table. This is basically a freely definable logical function of four binary inputs and one binary output. So it contains 16 bits for the 16 possible configuration of the inputs. The output goes into a D-type flip-flop, and the output of the flip-flop is the output of the uh, logic cell. The output of the logic table is also um, uh, output to a special uh, lookup table output, which can al only be used in a certain way, I'll explain later. Um, then there is the carry unit. The carry unit takes the inputs number one and two, and the carry signal from the uh, from the log logic cell before. And if zero or one of these uh, signals are one, then it outputs a zero. And uh, if there are two or three ones, then it, it outputs a one. So it basically takes a majority vote. This is how this looks in combination with the lookup tape uh, with the logic cell before and after. Um, the carry output of the log uh, logic cell before is the new carry input for uh, this logic cell, and it can also be routed to the input three. All the inputs can normally be routed to any generic output in the FPGA, but Input three can also be routed to the carry output of the um, of the logic cell before, and input two can al also be routed to the lookup table output of the input uh, logic cell before. These are the only way how you can directly access these two outputs. There are a number of things which can be configured in a logic cell. First of all, uh, you can configure the contents of the lookup table, of course. Then you can configure if the uh, flip-flop should be used. Uh, you can say, um, don't use the flip-flop, then the output of the lookup table is directly taken as the output of the logic cell. You can configure if the reset signal uh, takes effect immediately or with the next clock. And you can configure if the reset or set signal should set the flip-flop to zero or to one, if it's a set signal of it or it's a re reset signal. You can also configure if the carry unit is used, but that's not useful if you're using the carry logic, so normally you'll set this to one if you're using the carry output. There are some other tile, types of tiles. There is RAM tiles. Um, something which is special about RAM tiles is they are double height. Um, there is always one top RAM tile and one bottom RAM tile, which together make up one whole RAM tile. There is uh, I.O. tiles. Each I.O. tile contains two I.O. blocks, which each can control one I.O. pin. And I.O. tiles also have a special wire called fab out, um, which does not have a uh, purpose in the I.O. tile. Instead, every uh, um, function outside the fabric is connected to some fab out wire somewhere. So there are I.O. tiles whose fab out wire controls resetting the FPGA, or driving global, global buffers, or um, uh, whose fab out wire are used as input for PLLs. Each 1K chip has one PLL, uh, 8K chips has two, have two PLLs. Um, these are, uh, th for example, useful if you want to convert one clock signal into another clock signal with another frequency. So you could for example, use the 12 megahertz clock signal of the iStick and convert it into a 48 clock, uh, megahertz clock signal. Um, the inputs of the PLLs are uh, fab out wires of specific I.O. cells. The clock outputs are routed directly into the input paths of uh, special other um, I.O. tiles. And the non-clock outputs are accessible via uh, neighbor uh, output 
whereas at the corners of the tile fabric. So these are the individual blocks which you can use in the FPGA, but you need to connect the outputs and inputs in some way. One way you've already seen uh, is the carry output, which is automatically uh, connected to the next uh, carry input in the next logic cell. Then you can use the outputs of the eight tiles in the Moore neighborhood of a tile directly. You don't need any special routing for that. And then there are span wires. Span wires connect a number of tiles horizontally or vertically. Um, there, is only, uh, there is also peripheral span wires, which run along the I.O. tiles at the edges, but these have um, more complex rules for interconnectivity, so I'm not talking about them now. And there is eight global wires which connect to every tile in the fabric. This is how a span wire works. Um, it con a span four wire connects, well, five tiles in a row, but only in four tiles you can really access them. Um, in these four tiles, the span wire can be routed to any input of uh, these tiles. But there is only one specific output every second tile which can be routed to the span wire. So if you want to connect, for example, an input on the left tile to an, out, uh, an output on the left tile to an input on the right tile, then you have to choose the span wire according to the output because um, the input can be connected to any span wire, but the output can't. Each row of five tiles is connected by a group of twin span, uh, span four wires. Vertical span four wires are a bit more complex. Um, in addition to the four uh, tiles they would connect normally to, uh, they, only, uh, they also connect to the four tiles to the left, but only one of these tiles uh, can, uh, uh, only in one of these tiles, the span wire can connect to any input. On the other three, uh, it can only connect to every second input. So you have to keep that in mind when selecting which span wire to use. They are span 12 wires, uh, which span 13 uh, tiles in a row, but only 12 can be used the normal way. And there are vertical span 12 wires, which don't have the special neighbor tiles uh, the span 4 wires have. You can connect span wires at the end to identical span wires, which uh, are directly adjacent, uh, either in a row or orthogonally. So for example, if you're using the span wire at, uh, at the left point of the span wire to the top, you can connect to these additional tiles. And if you connect to the bottom two, to these tiles, and these are four span wires connected as an example, so there is a whole number of tiles to which this can connect. Then there is global buffers. Um, there is in total eight global buffers in the, uh, in the FPGA. Um, they, connect, they can connect to any input in any tile of the FPGA, but they can only be driven by sp uh, specific, uh, in specific ways. Um, either by an input pin, there, are, there is one special input pin for each of these eight global buffers uh, from which it can be driven, or by routing some signal to a fab out wire of one specific I.O. tile. Um, as an example, the, global, uh, the second uh, global wire, uh, the with number one, can either be driven by pin 21, which is the clock input of the I-stick, or it can be driven by the fab out wire of I.O. tile 717. Now, when looking at this, uh, this diagram, you may notice that the .as assembler in a source file on the processor side is not at the same level as the .ask uh, ASCII bit stream on the FPGA side. This is because these two concepts are not equivalent. Uh, the assembler source file is written in a way that humans can understand what's going on. It has mnemonics for the opcodes, um, it can be structured in uh, ways which make it easy to write assembler files. Um, ASCII bitstream files don't have this. They are basically a table of zero, zeros and ones. But there is something that corresponds to the level of the assembler source file. And this is a quite recent addition by me. 
um, it is a high-level bitstream format, which can be converted into an ASCII file. Now, as an example, let's look at the high-level representation of this rot uh, example. There is the command icebox ask to hlc, which takes an ASCII bitstream and converts it into a high-level representation. This takes a while because it's a Raspberry Pi. I didn't expect it to take so long. Ah, there was this. Um, as you can see, there are blocks for the tiles. Um, for example, uh, IO tile 7, 8, I think it is. Um, and these blocks contain statements for the um, I.O. blocks and the I.O. cells uh, in question. Now, the, the obvious thing, the, the first thing I did when I, uh, uh, when I created this format is see what does an empty design look like. I have prepared an example for that. Um, this is an empty design. It just defines one block, which does nothing, and the PCF file is empty. And when I create an ASCII bitstream for that, uh, it's already, and um, display that as a um, high-level bitstream. I really need to optimize this. Um, this is done in Python. It manipulates strings of zeros and ones. Uh, that's the way it's represented in iStorm. So I think it would be better to re-implement re it in C. <laughs> OK, what you will see is this is not empty. There is actually three tiles for which code is generated. Um, I have prepared a slide for that. Um, the first line basically specifies which device it is. In this case, the 1K device with a fabric size of 12 to 16 tiles on the inside, not counting I.O. tiles. Um, there is a warm boot directive. Um, this says whether the warm boot feature of the image is enabled or not. I'll explain this later. And um, there is uh, three I.O. tiles for which um, there is something configured. And if you follow the talk closely, you may guess what these do. Any ideas? OK, so the first two are the I.O. tiles into which the clock output of the PLL is fed. So for some reason, they are always defined as inputs, and the pull-up resistor is disabled. Um, this is just uh, Rachni PNR does this for uh, bitstreams, so I guess it's necessary. Um, the I.O. tile 617 is the one uh, with gray uh, pin from before, which is not connected to an output pin in this package. So for this um, for this I/O block, uh, an uh, input is enabled. This is done for every uh, I/O block which is not connected to a physical pin. So the next thing you may want to do with this format is create a configuration by hand. And for this, um, I will. Just uh, I will just ex explain a really simple example, which takes an input pin and uh, inverts it and routes it to an output pin. And on the I stick, there is uh, the, there are two headers which can be populated. One uh, called uh, G three, um, and pin one of the uh, pin three of G three is um, connected to pin sixty two. You can look up this either in the schematic of the I stick or in the documentation I created for this. Um, the green LED of the iStick is connected to pin 95. So pin, um, 90, uh, pin 62 is here on the bottom, connected to IO tile 90. And pin 95 is up here, connected to IO tile 39. So the most obvious way would be to route this 
to logic tile 99, use this as an inverter, and then route it uh, to the right to the I.O. tile. Now, this step is kind of obvious. You need a span, five, uh, span 4 wire. A span 4 wire only, uh, can normally only be connected to four um, logic cells. But in this case, since this is an I.O. tile, it can also access the contents of this uh, span wire. So you need a span wire in this group, and the groups are named by uh, the uh, row or column they are used in. So in this case, it would be uh, Y9. And then the group is named by the rightmost uh, tile it is connected to. So it is Y9, group 13. For the um, uh, vertical connection, you need a span 12 wire. But span 12 wires, there is only two span 12 wires in every group. And um, they can't connect to every output. So actually, you, in this case, you need to use a span uh, 12 wire, which goes two tiles up. Um, so it's uh, X9, Y11, uh, group 11, sorry. So this is how the high-level code looks like. Um, there is IO tile 9.0. Um, it only uses IO block 1 in this case. Input type is a simple input pin. Input is enabled. Uh, pull up is disabled. And the input, there is two input wires for each input pin and two output wires, which can be configured to several kinds of um, uh, IO logic. But we're use not using them here. We just use the simple uh, uh, input 0 which is routed to span 12, x9, group 11, um, wire number 0 in this case. In, IO, in logic tile 9.9, um, there is, uh, you can arbitrarily select any uh, lookup table, which span wire you need to use depends on which lookup table you use. In this case, I use lookup table 0. Um, the span wires are routed to the inputs of the lookup tables via local wires. Um, there is exactly one local wire for each span wire and input, so you have to look up which one to use there. The output in this case is just not the input 0, and it is routed to the span 4 wire. And in the output tile, it is configured as a simple input pin. Um, this is done for all uh, output pins, uh, just uh, configured as simple input pins. Um, as a simple output pin, uh, the pull-up is disabled, and um, the span wire is routed via some local wire to the output. I'll show this too as an example. Oops. Oh, um. This is the example file I showed before. It contains the uh, standard code for an empty design and then the three um, definitions. Convert this um, into an ASCII bit stream. Convert this into a binary bit stream using IcePack. And this can be programmed onto the flash of the eye stick. I have prepared this uh, prototype board with a few buttons so we can actually um, change an input. And as you can see, the middle uh, LED, the one, uh, the green one, is lighted. And when I press the first button, it goes out. OK. Um, yeah. So the configuration needs to be somehow uh, stored in the FPGA. 
and it is uh, stored in RAM, which means when uh, you remove the power from the iStick, um, the configuration of the FPGA is lost. So it has be transferred to the FPGA in some way every time the FPGA is powered up. There are three ways to do that. Um, the first way is using an external flash. The computer programs the configuration onto a flash chip and the FPGA uh, reads the configuration by itself from this uh, flash chip acting as an SPI master. Um, this is the uh, process used by most prototype boards, like for example uh, with the iStick. It has the advantage, you don't need to program the FPGA every time it's powered on. Um, you can just plug in the iStick and uh, it executes the last used configuration and uh, it can be changed again. The second way is to write the configuration directly to the SRAM of the FPGA. This has the advantage you don't need a uh, flash. For example, if you're automatically testing a lot of designs, then you could damage the flash uh, by rewriting it all the time. Um, this is avoided this way, um, but you need to uh, program the configuration onto the flash every time uh, it's powered on. This is, could, for example, be used if you have a board which contains a microprocessor. So the microprocessor configures the FPGA every time it's powered on and you don't need an extra flash. And um, you could, can do this with iceproc using the dot capital S option. Um, in order to do this on the iStick, you need to do some hardware modification. You need to actually physically remove the flash and one zero ohm resistor and connect the uh, output of the um, FTDI chip to the input of the FPGA. Uh, this is documented on Clifford's website. The third method is using the internal non-volatile configuration memory of the FPGA. If, you're, if you do this, you don't need any external hardware. The, flash, uh, the, the FPGA configures itself instantly from the data written onto it. But you can only do this once. Um, it's, it's only writable once, and uh, it's not exactly documented well. Um, <laughs> You can do it uh, using two different methods. One method is uh, to use a protocol like for a programming a flash chip. Um, this needs, compared to the direct SRAM writing, an additional wire. The SPI is open. You can do this using a uh, special pin of the FPGA, the uh, VPP fast pin, which is used when programming an FPGA in a factory. And you can use this to uh, obscure the uh, configuration from the user. So it's most probably not useful in a DIY context, except when maybe creating a riddle for another hackerspace or something like that. When the FPGA uh, is booted, um, it looks at the value of the SPI SSB pin. If this pin is low, then it waits to be configured by the computer or microprocessor via SPI. If it is high, then it reads uh, the uh, it acts as an SPI master and reads the configuration from the flash or uses uh, the NWCM uh, if it's configured. Um, and something which uh, is notable about the configuration process is uh, the configuration starts out as uh, completely zero and is replaced while the configuration is read. So in this moment where a bit is read, it immediately takes effect. So in order to avoid uh, chaos with the I.O. pins, uh, they are disabled during the configuration. After the configuration is done, uh, the I.O. pins are re-enabled. And uh, there is one special pin uh, called uh, C-Done which indicates the configuration is over, the FPGA is configured. The pins used for SPI can also be used as I.O., but they are uh, only released uh, 49 clock cycles later. Uh, these are configuration clock cycles, so this means if you want to use these uh, pins, you need to cycle the configuration clocks 49 times after the configuration is done in order for them to be released.
Now, I mentioned that you can use multiple configurations. Uh, this is only available when you're using configuration from Flash. Um, you can store up to five configurations on the Flash. And when the configuration is done, one of these uh, images is selected and used. So at every point in time, only one configuration can be active. Um, it is one plus four because uh, there is one configuration which is loaded by default when the, um, when the FPGA is started up. And you can select one of four configurations, um, but you can set it up in a way that these are different configurations, so you can't actually go back to the one loaded uh, on the start. Um, there are two mechanisms to do this. That's the cold boot mechanism. If this is enabled, the FPGA looks at the value of two pins and uh, uses them as a value, value from 0 to 3 and uses that to select one of up to four images. And there is the warm boot mechanism. If this is enabled, um, the FPGA can be rebooted uh, by, sending a, by setting a special fab out wire of one I.O. tile to high and um, can, uh, can switch to a different configuration. This is how you instantiate the warm boot directive from a Varilog source. Um, you have this uh, primitive sb uh, underscore warm boot, um, any name you want, and three parameters. Dot boot is some expression. If this goes too high, um, the FPGA is rebooted. And dot s1 and dot s0 are the ones which select which image to use. This is how a multi-boot image looks like. Uh, you have five headers. These headers contain uh, uh, addresses to the image to use, and then in any order the images uh, in the rest of the file. So, for example, you could, uh, on power on and for slots 0 and 1, use image A in this case, and for the others, image B. The cold boot bit is stored in the power on reset header, so it is uh, valid globally for the whole image, which makes sense because it's only executed once at startup. And uh, the warm boot bits are stored inside the images. So every image can enable or disable uh, the warm boot directive. Um, iStorm does not currently support disabling warm boot. It just assumes every uh, image uses uh, warm boot which is not a problem because um, if nothing is connected to this fabot wire, it's ju just uh, not used. Um, but I pushed some, um, some commits recently, uh, you'll find them in my repository I'll show at the end, uh, which allow changing this and actually using non-warm boot uh, configurations. These are the commands to create the multi-boot uh, images. Um, it's done using the tool iceMulti which takes up to four input images and outputs one, uh, one multi-boot image. You can use the option dash Z, uh, which is uh, multi, uh, uh, sorry, dash C, uh, which is uh, use cold boot mode. And you could use the option dash capital P, which specifies a different image to use for uh, uh, after power on or reset. Um, if you don't specify this option, the first image is used. This option is not yet in uh, upstream iStorm. You'll have to use my repository for that too. Um, oh, I'm going to show this in a demo. I've prepared five, Im uh, five um, Verilog sources. There is uh, the select that we, which uh, listens to uh, far for input wires and uses them uh, for input pins and uses them to decide which um, which image to use. And when one of these goes to high, it uh, triggers the warm boot primitive. And there are a V1, a C1, a C0 to C3, which. Uh, don't do anything except lighting up the green LED and zero to three red LEDs. So I'll just make this. The four, um, the four, the five conf configura 
the five configuration images are created and then IceMulti is executed to create the multi-boot image from them. Okay, I'll program that onto the FPGA. This takes a bit longer because the image is much larger. And you can see uh, the uh, this is the select um, image. And if I press a button now, then it changes to another configuration, um, which in this case is configuration zero. You can just reset the FPGA using icebrock-t. So when I now press button three, then I'm at configuration three, which lets three LEDs. And in this setup, I can't go back to the original image because it's not specified in any of the four slots. Okay, these are a few important um, um, in, uh, web addresses. First, the repository where I, uh, where I um, uh, committed the recent changes about which I was talking, which hopefully will be merged into Clifford Wolf's upstream ISOM repository. There is an iStorm website, which contains the, uh, the documentation of the bitstream. Um, then I am in the process of creating a new iStorm documentation, which contains a lot of the things I have been uh, explaining today. And finally, there is the datasheet of the Lattice Ice 40 FPGA, which is the official documentation. That's it from my part.